Migration has always been part of the social and political landscape in Europe. The use of migration as a political weapon is neither new. However, in recent years, it is increasingly becoming one of the central and more polarizing issues in European public debates. This is partly due to the rise of extreme right movements throughout the continent, since migration is one of the paramount elements of their political discourse, but not only. All over the political spectrum and in all sorts of media outlets, more and more leaders and opinion makers are adopting some of the frames promoted from exclusionary stances. On the other hand, a myriad of civil society organizations is trying to counter these hegemonic narratives and to build alternative ways of telling migration and integration issues. In a very contested and polarized context, some of them have more success than others. But why does that happen? What makes some narratives dominant over others? And how can we build new, appealing narratives on migration from the grassroots? These are some of the questions that we will try to answer with the help of some representatives from these very organizations. Join us in the discussion. This program is part of the Bridges podcast series produced by the Barcelona Center for International Affairs and funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 program. Thank you very much for joining us today in the second podcast of the Bridges Project. My name is Cristina Sala Soler, I'm Bridges Communications Officer, and I am happy to welcome you to this program where we will discuss the role of civil society in building alternative narratives on migration. To do so, I have with me three representatives from civil society organizations from different European countries. Ada Hugo Abara is the founder of Arising Africans, an association of Afro-Italians, that is, second and third generation Italians of African descent, who aim to deconstruct stereotypes and promote cultural awareness on black Italy and diasporas in Europe. Welcome, Ada. How are you? Thank you, Christina, for having me. Um, I'm fine. I'm fine. And I'm really happy to be part of this. Thank you, Ada. And sitting in front of her, There is Julie Tello, a member of Stop Mare Mortum, a citizen platform founded in Spain against the backdrop of the so-called refugee crisis in 2015, which aims to set up legal and safe pathways to access Europe and avoid deaths in the Mediterranean. Welcome, Julie. It is a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you, Julie. And in front of me, last but not least, there is Lisa Lynch, an active member of Zebruke Minds, a decentralized international social movement founded in Germany in 2018 and made up of local chapters that work to decriminalize sea rescue and to create safe havens for people fleeing to Europe. We are glad that you join us in this conversation, Lisa. Thank you, I'm fine. Thank you. So Ada, Julie and Lisa represent civil society organizations that were able to create alternative narratives on migration and to position them in the public debate, very often dominated by exclusionary discourses. But how did they do it? Let's find out. Opposition groups were screened from view and protected by a cordon of nationalist paramilitaries. Crazy! In 2020, the debate about the reform of the citizenship law in Italy was once again brought to the fore in the context of the worldwide protests for the murder of George Floyd in the US. A diverse group of civil society organizations, including Arising Africans, launched the campaign De la parte giusta de la historia, on the right side of history, which managed to mobilize people in favor of the right of children born and raised in Italy to get citizenship regardless of their parents' origin. In 2018, a group of activists began a satirical social media campaign in Germany after the Lifeline rescue ship was stranded in the Mediterranean with 234 people on board during days before being able to enter a port. Four years later, this social movement has taken the form of a decentralized network with more than 180 affiliated local chapters and over 300 German cities that have declared themselves as safe havens for migrants and refugees. In 2015, 900 people died after the wreck of a boat that was trying to reach the coast of Sicily. At that moment, a group of Spanish activists 
created Stop Mare Mortum, an organization that has ever since raised awareness and carried out political advocacy and strategic legal actions in order to defend legal and safe pathways of migration through the Mediterranean. All these are examples of successful civil society organizations that manage to promote alternative bottom-up narratives on migration. But when can we consider that a narrative has become successful? In all these cases, a combination of political, social and media outreach was paramount for these organizations to achieve their objectives. Which of these spheres of influence is more decisive for a narrative to have actual impact on the public debate? The floor is yours. Well, uh, Christina, I think that you just made some excellent questions and it will be really difficult to try to find an answer. But I will start by saying that there are different aspects or different layers to consider, especially thinking about our campaign in Italy. On the one hand, we have one goal only one to reach, that is a change in the Italian law on citizenship. But we know that in order to achieve our goal, we have to change the narrative on how the law is perceived. Because the mainstream uh, communication line is that citizenship law is linked to migration and security measures, while in reality we're only talking about kids that are born and raised in Italy and are already part of the Italian society. So uh, thinking about our goal, I would say that you can say the campaign was successful if it has reached the goal. But on the other hand, I'm also conscious about the shift in perspective that is being created in the meantime. And so I'm thinking about how the mainstream is starting to see the topic we are trying to address and how they are forcing also other political parties to talk about the, the subjects of the law and not only their political general idea. So maybe a campaign is successful when you are able to obtain that kind of shift. And at the same time, uh, our campaign is both mediatic, so a communication campaign, and a political campaign. So I would say that the all the, the spheres, political, social, and media, they collaborate in defining the success. And I don't think that one is more important than the other. So for, for instance, we have lobby meetings with uh, political parties, and we are talking with other civil society organizations, and we are also trying to bridge the media. So they all work uh, at the same time for the same, for the same goal. Thank you, Ada. Uh, it's very interesting because um, in your case, you're trying to reach a change in the law. And in the case of a Stop Mare Mortum, even if it's not the main aim of the organization, it's also an important part of its activities to, to achieve this change in, in the law. And how do, do narratives interact with this and with the questions that we're tackling here? Well, thank you, Christina. I, I totally agree with, with Ada. Uh, but, for example, when it comes to talk about uh, what sphere is more important, uh, for example, I would say that it depends of what you want to, to achieve. For example, it's not the same uh, to change the, percep the perception of the society about immigration than, for example, having some changes on the, on the law. For the first one, you probably need a narrative that arrives uh, to the mainstream, while for the second one, you might focus on transmitting the narrative to the public institutions in charge of changing uh, the law. In the case of uh, Stop Mare Mortem, for example, I would say that we are strong in the political advocacy. So for us, I would say that the political sphere is the most important one. Obviously, if your narrative has an important impact at both social and in the media, then you probably have more chances to, to get a change on the, on the political sphere. And nonetheless, we have to take into account that sometimes it's easier to change some public policies when they are not on the center of the public debate, and more if we talk about migration policies which can be used and manipulated by anti-immigrant uh, discourses. Thank you very much, Julie. I think you raised very interesting points. In your case, Lisa, you also, well, your organization also managed to provoke some changes in, not in the law, but at least in how some municipalities in Germany define themselves as safe havens. So what do you think? Which sphere is more important, at least for you and for your objectives as an organization? Yeah, so I think if we look at the local level, which is my level at the moment because I'm 
the part one part of an organization and i would say it's a political sphere is very important because on the local level it's easier it's close we when we do a, a demonstration outside if we have um, a protest or something sometimes politicians even come because they they want to be seen at this kind of uh, events and um, this is a good situation to to get in touch with them to talk and to see what they can actually do on a local level but yeah i would also say that media is important to transfer to other cities in germany and to awa make awareness about the topics we which are important for us because i think it's easier from um to spread our our demand through social media than to really change the law from now to then yeah i think this is something that we would all agree that as civil society organizations i mean opening a twitter account an instagram account is for free and you can do it and if you know how to manage social media you you have some chances of being successful in a very competitive world but how easy or how difficult is for you to get to these more mainstream media or political spheres from your own experience it's quite complicated i would say because uh it's all built on relationships and relationships take time so uh, i think that when we succeed in having the media coverage is because we we've been advocating on citizenship law for quite a time now and we we've started to build some some connections with some mainstream uh, media platforms and some journalists and so i think that when we started the campaign we just you know gathered together all our contacts of journalists and we say okay you know we are starting this thing and we might be sending you something from time to time so just be aware of that and that helped us but it takes time to reach that level while other um, organizations that are more structured they have a press office that's doing that full time and they are more able to to breach the media because they have that kind of organization empowered as small realities like ours don't have how is your experience lisa julie well uh, i would add that for example even though the ideal situation would be a combination of the three spheres sometimes we have to take into account that some organizations like stop my mortum they are just activists uh, nobody's paid so sometimes we have also to think about the resources uh, and that means that you have to choose what is fair you want to to tackle Uh, in order to, to transmit your, your narrative. In our case, we see that the media coverage, uh, it takes us a lot of effort mm -hmm. and we don't have that, uh, those resources. So uh, this is why we also focus on the political sphere or maybe more on the social sphere. So at the end of the day, it also has to do with practical decisions and real possibilities of each organization. I don't know how is the experience here at Zeebrook and Mainz? Um, it depends. Like when we are our small group, um, it's difficult to have access to the public media, common media. Well, mainstream media. Mainstream wide. media. <laughs> um, but if I look at the, the big movement, Seebrücke, over the years they have made their name. And um, since they are connected to Sea Rescue, which is also now part of our um, news sometimes, it is a topic people know about it. But the things which maybe stay in the head is when there are very big events. Like I think two years ago, the group in Berlin, they occupied the, the whole place before the parliament. And then um, they did like, a, like an installation or something. And that was in the news. And I think that's what attracts people also to join sometimes. To think, cool, they do something. And it even, like the, the impact is, is not seen yet but uh, people talk about it and it's um, not only about bad or sad news it's also about creating something together 
Yeah, so I think in your case it's a bit different because you get this media attention from through popular mobilization and not through uh, targeted media media campaign. Also because the characteristics of your movement is that it is very decentralized and very informal. No, it's part of the of the charming and also of the challenge, I guess. Right. Yeah. Well, I think we're done and that you lay already fertile ground and a very interesting discussion for this second part of the podcast. Welcome here. Refugees are welcome here. Refugees are welcome here. Refugees are Some political analysts, though, say that is not it's something to celebrate. <laughs> So we have so far reflected on what success is and when can we consider that an alternative narrative on migration has become successful. But how can civil society organizations achieve this? What are the best strategies to do so? What are the most useful frames to explain migration? Should civil society be more propositional or confrontational towards exclusionary discourses? Should we use more data? or emotions when communicating about migration. So who wants to start? Maybe Ada? It really depends on the topic because sometimes you need, you need to consider all the stakeholders that are involved and you need to think uh, outside what you normally do because you need to find some alternatives to the strategy that was implemented before if it's a topic that's been repeated over time or other times maybe you are just Uh, bringing the topic out for the first time so you have you can be free in choosing your strategy I think but then at the same time I don't know if it's better to be uh, propositional or confrontational because it also I'm thinking about the Italian uh, the Italian society and sometimes being confrontational pays because you are showing that you have more arguments in favor of your position than other parties. But other times it's better to build something new. And also, as it depends on the scenario and on the topic, I think that data and emotion, they work together for the majority of topics. And sometimes when you want to reach a large audience then or an ambivalent audience, you have to rely on emotions because it's something they can easily understand but then once you you have their attention you need to provide data you need to tell maybe they won't remember all the numbers but they remember something especially if you have some key data to use and you can just keep on remarking the same numbers over and over again Okay, thank you very much, Ada. Um, Lisa, in the case of your organization, since it started as a satirical campaign, what do you think? It's more important to be pro on the propositional side or on the confrontational side? Um, I think the, the first step for us is more um, the confrontational, <laughs> confrontational side. Um, I think it's the first impulse. It's like um, we see something and it's we, we have to be against it or make sure make clear that it's not acceptable no I, i just think it's it's good to make clear that some things are, are not okay to say i mean everything it's a freedom of speech everybody can in germany legally can say what they want but um, i think it's good if there are groups which are from the society who are like a, a shield or somehow go against it and say this is not acceptable in our um, society because um, we have other values and yeah so I think that's the the first step because it's maybe easier um, to react but I think it's a, a good idea to then offer something else. As you were saying maybe the first step or the first natural step for a civil society or an initiative campaign is to be confrontational because you're responding to an issue. In all your cases, you were responding to, to an issue as a founding reason. But throughout the time, you have to become propositional. Otherwise, you may be tiring people or you may lose media interest or politicians would say, okay, you're just complaining, but what do you propose? Um, but the other debate that I was trying to introduce as well is about the frame, frames. How do we explain migration? Is migration useful because of the labor market? Is migration natural because it's been going on 
and on for for centuries and and so on is migration something about cultural enrichment what do your organizations think about this julie would you like to answer well for example in estomar mortum we we got that debate uh, we should talk about immigration as something of rights of human rights or we should tackle it uh, talking uh, with a utilitarian frame and again the answer is that it depends for us it should be a more important the human rights frame because we are not talking about them or us we are talking about human rights which are the basic once we have the 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 basic line which is the human rights then we can also talk about other rights in other way maybe and then it comes when you can use the utilitarian uh, frame and for example when you go to talk to politicians sometimes you have to to use this utilitarian uh, frame for example talking about the budget so again it depends of the audience you you want to reach if you want to to reach the whole society maybe is more useful and a, a utilitarian uh, frame because people are gonna understand it better and more when we are in a context of crisis, for example. Mm -hmm. But for us, for Stop My Mortum, I think that uh, the human rights frame should be uh, the basic one, the, the most important one. But we have to think that some uh, frames sometimes are more useful than, than the others. So there can be a difference between what are the organization's objectives or priorities or even moral considerations and what is useful to reach those objectives, right? So, Ada, in your case, what do you think? What, what are the frames, at least for your campaign, that were more, more useful to get so mainstream? Uh, I think the debate was really similar to what, they, what Julie had because the utilitarian frame is easy and it has been used several times in the past. But as people that are directly impacted by the law, uh, we didn't really want to use it. So it's one of the things we excluded immediately because sometimes in Italy when they're talking about um, citizenship, right, they say, okay, they contribute to the GDP of the country, then they do this, they do that, and it doesn't really represent us. The first thing we stated in our campaign is that our objective is that citizenship law will consider obtaining citizenship a right for people. So that was the main thing. And all our narration was about rights, human rights, basic rights, the Italian constitution, and that's what we did. We were conscious that choosing that one was like the difficult path <laughs> because once you talk about numbers or you talk about utility, then you have more people able to understand it. But normally talking about how something can be useful is easily linkable to the narration of having to deserve something. So I think that brings a certain number of discrimination and stereotypes that can be traced from them. So we normally choose to talk in general terms about rights, about how the law should recognize the life of people that are already living in Italy. And in general, when we are talking about migration, we do the same. We say it's just a matter of where you were born on the earth. It's not something that depends on you. It's something that you're just you're just born in. So choosing to talk about rights is complicated because uh, normally people want something that they can understand easily or they can touch, something that looks really, yeah, simple and straightforward. And rights is not simple mm -hmm. and straightforward. So it's the complicated way to reach it. But it's the one that we, we've chosen because... Yeah, we don't want to trade our dignity for for a law. And we think that the law has to see and respect our dignity. Julie, would you yeah. like to ask, add something? Yeah, it's very very interesting what Ada is saying, because in Estomar Mortum, for example, we have the, the debate, uh, shall we use uh, the term refugees or migrants or both at, at the same time? Uh, does refugees deserve more than migrants? So 
it's a very interesting debate. And for example, for us, and going back to, to the frame, we prefer to use the, the human rights frame because it incorporates both of them migrants and refugees. And when it comes to talk to the society, I think that it's important to have this, these basics. But we have to be honest. And uh, for example, in the legal project we, we have, we need to use this distinction. And the important thing for the public debate is maybe to incorporate new realities to the refugee term. Yeah, I think what you're saying, it's very interesting for two reasons. One is that you don't use the same narrative if, if you want to, or the same frame, if you want to address or achieve a legal change, then if you want to achieve social awareness about that, that topic, is that what you're saying? And also, I think it's important to accept multicausality as part of human mobility. So you can be at the same time, refugee and an economic migrant, right? Why not? So yeah. I think all these we could be debating for hours. I don't think we have more time. And I don't think there is just one right answer. So unless you want to add something to the debate, I think I, I will try to wrap up this discussion with one question for each of you, okay? Which is... If you had to give just one very, very quick tip for a civil society organization that is starting, that is trying to create a new narrative on migration due to any specific reason, what would it be? What could you tell them in one minute, if possible? Well, I think that maybe the first thing is just to know what you can actually do, like to know your members, know which skills they have and which priorities they can carry out in the first term. Because it's tricky to start, like, we want to overdo, it's normal, it's in the human behavior, like, we want to achieve everything, so we want to do 2,000 things at the same time, what we can't. Especially for small organizations that are volunteers, then they have to study your work or so, it's good to know, like, your priorities, one, two, three, that's it, and you say, okay, we start with this. Once we grow and we have more people, more uh, ability to do multiple things then we can add other priorities so it's yeah prioritized based on how many people you are and what you can actually do so be realist yeah you know, absolutely right? <laughs> and julie what would you tell an organization that is starting to work with narratives on migration well uh, there is no a magical recipe uh, i would say that uh, as we said before it depends of what goal you want to achieve and then you have to create your own strategy. But for example, in our case that we focus on the political advocacy, I would say that it's basic to become uh, an expert on the issue you want to, to focus on. And for this, it's very important to build up a, a network of, of experts that allows you to, to get the knowledge and become a, a key actor in the issue you want to, to tackle. I think it's important for two reasons. First of all, because you know what you are talking about and that probably will help you to, to do better proposals. And for the second reason, I would say that it's important to, to become a key actor because uh, you get credibility. And once you have credibility, I think that it's also easier to have a, a success uh, transmitting your, your narrative. Okay, so be realistic and becoming an expert. So two very uh, easy tips. Practical. <laughs> Practical <laughs> tips. So, well, thank you so much, Ada, Julie and Lisa for this super interesting discussion, which I am sure it would be very, very useful for all the civil society organizations working to change the hegemonic narrative on migration. And thank you to those who have listened to us until now. We'll meet again in the next podcast of The Bridges Project. Thank you so much. This program is part of the Bridges podcast series produced by the Barcelona Center for International Affairs and funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 program.